So much that I've, this, this, this week I've worked 75 hours so far. So, what? yeah, so I'm a little bit <laughs> fried. Now, to begin with today, we best have a look at this. So, thank you to the 34 people who completed this survey. There are 34 people in this room at the moment. So, I'm going to make the assumption that the people who did this are sitting here. The other 30 people who aren't here are going to get a really arse email later, but I can't single them out. So first thing I want to say is, if you're here, this email later does not apply to you, okay? Now, 34 responses, roughly in line with the breakdown of um, the gender profile of media as a degree, you might ask at some point in your studies, why, if 76% of students on media degrees are female, why isn't 76% of the staff in the media department female to reflect this? Ask this question. This is an important question. And we have... 
This is obviously the, these are the questions I'm interested in, and there are only three books. There is a perception that Facebook is becoming unimportant, and in particular in your generation, unused. Albeit, 60% of people here say that they use Facebook. What do you use it for, I did not ask, but it does indicate that there is at least some importance with regards to Facebook. Instagram, as we know, belongs to the same parent company as Facebook does. That company is now known as Meta. All of the respondents use this. This means that although you may have made an active choice not to engage with Facebook as a platform, your use of Instagram means that you contribute to the overall operation of the company that owns Facebook. If you have an account on Instagram, you in effect have an account on Facebook. If you were to be in a position where you did not have an account on either of those platforms, then should you use WhatsApp, you would still legitimately have an account. Because again, WhatsApp is a service which is owned by the same parent company. But here is the starting point for why I still think Facebook is really important. Let's consider an individual who has no presence and no account on Facebook as a platform, Instagram as a platform, or WhatsApp as a platform. Would they then have an account which contributed to that company? I'll call it a meta account. Would they still be part of that company, do you think? No. No. Wait. No, yeah, no. no. <laughs> no. Okay. You can stick with no as an yeah, answer. That's but that. it is only a two word a two letter answer, but I'm I'm for, I'm behind it. Not totally. yet. Don't get too ambitious then. I think we know what, right? You, you, you're running ahead of me, dude. It's, it's, it's spinning me out a bit. Um, the answer we've had from Joe is no. The answer that Joe has given is perfectly sensible. It is also incorrect. But Joe wasn't to know that. So we will not belittle Joe for getting the answer wrong. The answer is incorrect because Facebook as a company, Meta, has a profile for all of us, whether we use their platform or not. They deploy technologies across the entirety of the internet and other services we run on that internet. Other platforms as well, like you know, Facebook's a platform which runs on it. If you use an app, you are not using the World Wide Web. But they deploy various technologies across the entirety of the internet to scour information about individuals which they use to construct profiles of those individuals. Whether you have an account or not is actually kind of irrelevant. If you do have an account, their profile of you is far more detailed and informed by interactions with the products that they design for the purposes of obtaining data about you. So they would, I guess, you know, put it this way, they would prefer if you had an account with one of their platforms. But it is not entirely necessary that you do have an account with one of those platforms. There are people globally who don't have any presence on this platform, this overall Meta platform, but Meta has a profile of them. Meta scours information about them. It constructs a profile of who that person is. So the focus of what I want to do today is get into exactly what this means. Because although Facebook as a phenomena might not be as important today, what that company does is absolutely fundamental to understanding social media cultures. They are the exemplar of how this is done. They are basically the masters of the business model of social media. They invented it, they perfected it, and they continue to perfect it. And they've even anticipated their flagship product being less used 
and I've anticipated that a long time ago. The purchase of Instagram wasn't done just because Instagram was a competitor. They identified that as time went on, their flagship product, Facebook, may well become less popular. This is a normal thing in the what we call the product development life cycle, that eventually when it reaches maturation, you will have a decline at some point. Anticipating that decline, they have invested in other services which they anticipate will not undergo a similar decline, like image sharing site Instagram, like instant messaging service WhatsApp, to maintain what we call, and what you've heard me say in the past, I suspect, on videos and so on, a hegemonic position in the industry. But, smart ass Leighton, I use the word hegemonic. What does that mean? Can somebody tell me? Sophisticated-ish? I don't know. Just okay. It's a sophisticated word. Yeah, it is. It's not quite what it, it's not what it means, but I see where you're coming from. Like you kind of you get you get in there you get in there. Hegemonic in this context, dominant. Hegemonic, dominant, but not just dominant. It sets the rules for everyone else. It becomes the very way that we understand how this things works. This thing works. This is hegemonic in that it isn't just the dominant way of doing things, it is the way that everyone else copies and the way that we think of how this phenomenon actually works in practice. That's why, despite declining user numbers on the platform of Facebook itself, and there is a decline, but it's not that big a decline. It's, it's still the most heavily used platform in the social networking space. Be under no illusions, it's still the biggest. There is a decline in numbers, but it is still the largest. The hegemonic position of this company leads us to deep understandings of privacy, sharing culture, and in particular, what happens to our data. So what I want to cover today, who are Facebook exactly? Key concept, what is digital oil? This is have you heard this phrase previously? I see some shape and heads. I am here to illustrate and tell and share with you people my knowledge. This is what I do. This is my thing. I'm here for it. The notion of surveillance as a overarching aspect of contemporary society. And most importantly, that phrase at the end, there is no such thing as a free lunch. Has anyone in this room ever had a free lunch? We have, a, we, we have one hand up a lot. <laughs> How, pray tell, did you obtain a free lunch? Hmm? In church? What did you have to do in order to get that free lunch, go to church. And while you were at church, I'm, you know, I, don't know, I don't think it's a good idea for me to go to church, by the way. I think I'll burst out in flames or something. But um, while you were at the free lunch at church, were you perhaps given some information about how the church operates and some of the services which are available at said church? You weren't, you weren't given the hard sell? Man, religion has changed in a big way. What I'm trying to get is that you know, usually when we are given a free lunch, we are asked to do something for it. Next year, around about this time, you will be offered a free lunch. Good. It's pretty cool. Amazing, right? But there's a catch. In order to have that free lunch, you will be asked to complete the survey. The survey is called the National Student Survey, NSS for short. And you will be offered, you know, come and have a slice of pizza and talk with your lecturers and then do this thing because we need to get a certain number of people to complete it in order for the, rec for the results to count. And of course, the free lunch puts you in a good mood. 
She's like, yeah, free pizza, you know, cola, you know, drugs, caffeine, bubbles. I'm happy now. The idea is that you will have a more favourable position to filling in said survey. So it's a sick world we live in, people, all right? But there is no such thing as a free lunch because that free lunch comes with conditions. And every time you are offered a free lunch, this is something I have learned with bitter experience. Now I get emails from saying, free coffee and donuts available in this building today. I was like, I am not going. Because as soon as I walk through that door, they will ask me to do something and I've already got a lot of shit on, so I'm not going. So now I turn down the free lunch. That kind of makes me sad. We, as people, need to recognise that the free lunch we are given in social media, you don't pay to use Instagram, you don't pay to use Facebook, you don't pay to use WhatsApp, you don't pay to use TikTok and so on. That free access comes with a direct, tangible, cost. That cost comes from what can be taken from you in your usage. You generate money. How do you do this? Well, as a basic outline before I get there in the lecture, Jess has a job. Yeah? And she is doing great work also. When I go in to get my milk for coffee in the morning, there is Jess doing all the good stuff. Now, Jess, you were working this morning, right? Yep. Excellent. Jess, you don't have to tell me how much, but for that work you did this morning, are you going to be paid for it? Yes. Outstanding, I am glad to hear it. They are not exploiting Jess in that way, although I doubt it very much. But if they're she, so I wouldn't expect. Exactly. But hey, karma, pay it forward. So, Jess exchanges her time and effort, which we call labour, for financial reward. Her wages, money, she gains capital from expending labour in that way. That's how it works, right? When you use social media to generate value for the company that owns it, you are spending time and doing things so you are active, and they are converting that into value for that company. So you are performing labor. But unlike Jess, you are not getting financially rewarded for that. They do not pay you a wage. You are unpaid labor. Now historically, we have had words that describe people who do wages for no money. I'm not going to use them here because they're quite sensitive in this day and age. But there is a long history of this exploitation in human history. I am not suggesting that it is commensurate with some of these movements in the past, but it is still something we need to consider. If the entire business model of some of the most successful companies on earth is based on free labor, there are significant problems with that model. Yeah. So, this is where we will go in this lecture. Do we have any questions to begin with? No? You all settled in? You all happy? Good. <coughs> Fantastic. Um, this is what happens on the Facebook platform. Just to eradicate some of the notion that the, it doesn't matter anymore. I got this... I'm not, I'm not very good in meetings, okay? So, for the last year or so, I've been working with a group called Qualifications Wales about the redesign of the GCSE Media Studies curriculum in Wales, which was radically in need of an overhaul. Did anyone do GCSE Media Studies by yeah, show of hands? Yeah, a few of you? Terrible, isn't it? It'll be less terrible from this point onwards, fortunately. But it, during those discussions, um, I can't, I, I'm not going to give details, but somebody said, uh, this was a school teacher, said, I don't, I don't see the point of teaching anything about Facebook because, you know, none of the kids in school use Facebook. I was like, okay. Well, you know, I'm sure none of the kids in school use, you know, 
chemicals in the way you do in a chemistry class, but you still fucking teach them how to do it, right? You still do practical things again. I've never used algebra. But I remember in school being taught that shit, you know, how to calculate the area of a fucking thing, right? You know, CD plus AX equals fucking N or some shit. I remember all that, right? I, you know, spent a lot of the time in the snooker hall rather than doing it, but yeah. I, I recall doing a lot of things at school which weren't particularly applicable to everyday life. Now, my point, which I actually made, was, well, it is true that those 14 to 16-year-olds might not be using Facebook, but that doesn't mean that Facebook isn't using them. And it also doesn't mean that Facebook's influence, when you have a service where 757 million people log into it daily, it does not mean that that does not have an effect on the wider culture in which people exist in. You personally may not log into it, but 757 million people around the world do every day. On a weekly basis, that doubles. It's more than 1.5 billion people use that service per week. That is a significant cultural platform in that case, and that means we need to understand that platform. You might not buy a newspaper every day, but you need to know about how newspapers work and how they produce news, right? So, if you look at some of the numbers and the scale of what we are talking about here, it becomes very apparent. In a minute, the Facebook platform generates $11,000 for the parent company. Every minute. That means it exceeds the average wage of a person in the UK in three minutes. What somebody works for 365 days a year in the UK as an average wage, which is roughly about 33,000 pounds, it is pulling up down basically in three minutes. And then it's got the rest of the hour to go. And the rest of the 24 hours to make up a day, etc., etc. This is a huge company. It up, or just on the Facebook platform, nearly a quarter of a million images are uploaded every minute. A million every four minutes. There's a huge trove of cultural information going on here. Now, what is significant about all these numbers? What, do, what does this indicate? <clears throat> Things that people are doing at the company. Jen, that is the best answer in the history of answers. This is things that people are doing. It is not a static page. People are always interacting with it and doing things. And that doing is where that figure comes from. These things that people do, all this stuff generates that. If they didn't do that, that number would be either small or non-existent. People interact with this platform, and it generates money. Small, you can, you, know, you can do totals on this, and yeah, whoa. You're talking about hundreds of millions of interactions every minute with the platform, and it's only generating $11,000. Okay, so you can see that the scale of each interaction is actually going to be quite small. But when you've got that many data interactions going on in a minute, you are just still generating a huge amount of profit. That money made is the money that comes above the operating cost. <coughs> that is profit. So, what happens there, basically, is people do loads of stuff. And by doing, they generate money. So, these stats are a little out now, but actually, I looked up this year's stats and they've actually not changed. This is just American data, but American data is important because America actually has more social media use than most other countries in terms of usage. Facebook is still, because of its profile with older demographics, it is still the most used um, for people who log in several times a day, which is... As we know, Facebook owns these other services as well. So, 
it is interesting to note what Facebook does when it calculates the value of a company it's going to buy. When it bought WhatsApp, it calculated the value of every user on WhatsApp at $42. It believes that it can make, through its customer relationships, its customers being people who purchase advertising mostly on, that, on its platform, it believes it can leverage every user of WhatsApp at the value of about, well, it paid $42 for each user. And to be fair, it thinks it can make more than that. You don't make a business decision and you think, well, I'm going to pay this and then I'm just going to make that back. It's a static business model. It's not going to make any money. So Facebook's valuation of each customer on WhatsApp is different. It believes, actually, probably that they're worth about 60 something like that. Have you ever had an advert on WhatsApp? No? So how does it make money? There are some, but like not, not for your page, but for news pages and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I believe that's true. I, I don't use that part of the service, but yeah, I can understand that that's I, I understand that that's correct, yeah, uh, but I've never experienced it myself. What is it? How does it make money out of WhatsApp? What do you use WhatsApp for? That's exactly what it says on the tin, right? Okay, so we send messages to people. What do messages contain? Information. About what? Our lives. I feel like we're talking in vagaries here. Information about our lives, nice. <laughs> now we're getting somewhere. We use WhatsApp to share information with other people about what we are doing, how we are feeling, where we are going, what we're planning to do, what we would like to do, how we would like to do it, with whom we would like to do that thing. Yeah? It's an everyday conduit to communication. We speak to people through the service. Facebook aggregates that data. It looks at what kind of activities. Now you see, oh, but it's end-to-end -end encrypted. <laughs> Based on your usage and connections and your scale of usage on it, Facebook can use that information to build up a profile of you which can be sold to advertisers. You can then be targeted on the basis of your WhatsApp profile by a variety of sources when you use other platforms or the WhatsApp platform itself. It creates an image and a way to construct a digital version of you. And that digital version of you, per annum, is about $40. It's value. You might think $40 isn't much. Yeah, times it by a billion. <laughs> now you start to see how it's worth something, right? So, when it bought Instagram, it rated, and people thought they were insane at the time, uh, it rated Instagram users as worth about $33 a head for the same principle. People at the time thought, you have paid far too much for this service. You've lost the plot completely. Facebook is going to go down. Nobody could see how there was any value in that purchase. It's made a shit ton of money for Facebook. Way more money than anyone ever anticipated. That figure on the basis of 30 million monthly active users, so they paid 1 billion for Instagram. Their generated money from Instagram per month is not far off that figure that they paid for it in 2012. So Instagram paid for itself and a lot more uh, and has been a huge cash cow. Friend feed you probably don't know about, um, but it was a service which allowed um, the mapping of networks between people. They paid $47 each for that, but that service has become incredibly important because it allows targeted advertising to people who sit outside their platforms. So, it's the world's most popular social networking site. And these sites, as we know, 
integrate different media, information and communication technologies allow at least the generation of profiles that display information describing the user, display the connections, the establishment of connections, and communication. We know these are the fundamental basics of what a social networking service does. From these basics, Facebook looks to leverage as much value as possible out of every individual user. And I think, okay, well, how does this break down? You construct a profile, it has your identity. You connect to other people, it doesn't just have your identity, it has your network of connections. Therefore, it can start to make connect, it can look at those people and their profile as well and start to intimate what kind of person you are based on the connections and the types of people that you connect to. And then you have communication between users. It can then start to establish what kind of things you're interested in, what kind of things you enjoy, what kind of things you enjoy talking about, who you like doing them with, where you like doing it, what times you like doing it, etc., etc. So every piece of information that goes into this is leveraged in order to make you a more efficient piece of information to be sold. The whole thing here is about how can we make as detailed a picture of you as possible. The growth of Facebook was exponential. Started in 2000, as, uh, just as by, has anyone seen the film Social Network? Yeah. I see a few people nodding. It's a fairly accurate film, to be fair. It's, if you haven't seen it, it's actually probably worth watching as well. It's, it's a pretty good film, in all fairness. But, um, and if you're doing a <laughs> module on social media cultures, you probably should watch that film, really. Um, it's a fairly accurate detailing of what actually went on in the foundation of Facebook. For those of you who have seen it, or you may have read about this, does anyone know how, what kind of service Facebook began as? Zuckerberg's initial website. It is, it is detailed in that movie. Is there dating site? Like kind of, Lily. Really. That's what it was. Zuckerberg's initial website before founding Facebook was a site called Hot or Not, where people would contribute <laughs> photographs of uh, women from Harvard University who were based on the campus, and then you could rate said woman on the basis of whether that woman is hot or not. It did exactly what it said on the tin, and then you would have an average rating of how hot that person is according to users of the site. This tells you a vast amount about Mark Zuckerberg as a person. I really thought he was quite you are, But you think he's more of a wanker now, don't you? He looks yeah. like an alien to me. He's, a he's um, I mean, I don't want to be like the guy who points fingers at somebody for having mental health issues because of my own, but that guy's got mental health issues. <laughs> so, I might have ADHD, right? that guy's got things going on, right? So, um, yeah. So, <laughs> Facebook started as a platform serving Harvard University in 2004. Zuckerberg was advised by um, the administrators at Harvard University to take down his hot or not site and instead he worked with a couple of other people to create this site. A site where you could, as a student at Harvard, create a profile, link to other people that you knew on courses and so on or in the same dorms or you know how that works and make connections on it. Right from the outset of doing that those people, Zuckerberg being one of them, and his other people who he was working with there, as soon as they put that live and people started using it, they realized something almost instantly. Anyone want to guess what that revelation was? 
so, like within weeks of people starting to use the service and traffic increasing and so on, they were suddenly accumulating something, which they figured, hey, we can do something with this. It was not what, no. I can see where you're coming from, Alice, but that's not it. Data, did you say? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly it. Data. They started to accumulate, even from this really small base of opening, a lot of data about people. Not just demographics, which people were putting in, you know, how tall we are, how much they weigh, you know, where, what their hometown was like, etc. What courses they were doing, you know, what television programs they liked, what films they watched, you know, what music they liked, etc. All of this stuff, every person was leaving breadcrumbs. Basically, every time they did something, every time they used it, they left data behind. And they really quickly realized, hey, shit, we've got a big thing. You know, this guy here loves pizza. Does this get fucking Pizza Hut on the phone? I say, we know all the people in Harvard University who really love pizza. We can tell you who they are and you can market directly to them. So you don't have to print out a bunch of stuff at this point, you know, you don't have to print out all these flyers, which is gonna cost you money, and then litter them all over the campus. Instead, we'll tell you exactly who those people are, and you can go direct to them. What did the Pizza Hut do with that? Hell yeah, you just sold advertising. You just sold marketing for years, we even put an advert out on national television, hoping that we might get 10% of those who watch that advert to buy a pizza. But it's a scattergun approach, right? It costs a lot of money. And it costs a huge amount of money to produce something like that, distribute it, get network access. All of a sudden, what these guys are going and telling us is that we know who all the pizza lovers are. We'll tell you who they are. We'll broker it ourselves, so you're paying us for that information. But we will give you direct access to every pizza lover in this university. How much are you going to pay us for that? Pizza Hut turned around and said, well, this is what we pay on advertising per year. We don't have to do that with these guys. Because we're not dealing with like network television and so on. We're not dealing with actually producing these products. So it's going to bring our overheads for marketing right down. And it's going to increase the likelihood of success of that marketing campaign. Fucking flip. Perfect. What they had stumbled upon really quickly was a way of directly targeting people in a closed system based on their own personal preferences. So you no longer have to rely on demographics as a guiding principle. You no longer have to rely on you know, television networks to cover the, you know, and to carry that sort of information and schedule it in particular ways where you might not even be getting at your core demographic. Instead, you can go straight to them. This happened really, really quickly. Within a matter of weeks, they realized, hell, we are on to something which is going to make us very, very rich. Eight years after opening the company, Facebook did uh, its initial public offering. An initial public offering is when a company which is held in private hands becomes a public company and its shares are traded on a stock market called an IPO. Facebook's initial IPO in 2012 was at $104 billion, the biggest IPO in history. This immediately became the most valuable company ever to be floated on the stock exchange. But that happened before it had even started to be floated on the stock exchange. This, of course, meant that Zuckerberg and Hughes and the rest became billionaires overnight. They were the primary shareholders in the company at the IPO. It meant that they became immensely wealthy straight away. They had already accrued a great deal of wealth from their product already. This blew that out of the water. <clears throat> so when you see Zuckerberg, right, looking weird and you know, looking like he's got his hair cut for like eight quid, realize that that dude ain't got just eight quid. <laughs> that dude's got a lot of money, okay? He is Bezos rich, all right? 
So, this is not just a big company at scale, this is an incredibly wealthy company. If you're thinking of jobs in the media, and you want to make money, these are the guys you're going to work for. Unfortunately, 80% of the people that they hire are maths and physics graduates. Do you know why? Why would Facebook hire, not hire media graduates, they'd hire maths and physics graduates? Jess? Absolutely. Nearly everyone who works for them is a coder. Algorithmic programmers there to make the system that they have developed for capital approval better, basically. And the best people to do that are people who can handle long, complex equations, and it tends to be maths and physics graduates at the end of the day. So, Facebook, the platform, revenue in 12 months uh, during, well, just before the pandemic, was $75 billion. In if you converted that to GDP, Facebook would be one of the 10 wealthiest countries on earth. It's a social networking site. It's, its annual revenues are more than all but a few countries on the planet. It basically entirely owns the market for digital advertising. This is why I kind of have a problem with how we do digital marketing in this university. This is not actually something aimed at my colleagues in media because the business school also does um, digital marketing. And the, ostensibly what they all miss the point of is one company controls it all. Digital marketing and advertising is all that company. If you don't know that, you don't really understand what you're doing in the context that you're doing it in. All you have to look is where the money is. That company, they are so much bigger than anyone else, it's not even funny. They're, even, they're huge even compared to Google, who are massive, but their revenues dwarf Google's. So, what is Facebook then? Well, Colin and Tanya Bush, who wrote a book called Facebook. Uh, Facebook is Facebook. That's what we call a tautology, my friends. That is when the subject of a sentence is included in the predicate. Facebook is Facebook. It doesn't really explain anything. It is, but what the point she's making is, it isn't just one thing. It is far, far bigger than just being one thing. It's not, a, it's not that blue network. It is much bigger than that. And it's completely outdated to think of that. Facebook actually is a global operating system and a serious political, cultural, and economic power broker. Facebook's influence globally gives it power. When Facebook does things, states listen. It has the ability to manipulate and change actual democratic institutions. It has the ability to affect how countries are run. For Tim Morton, that means it's what we call a hyper object. It sits above things like nation states, borders, laws. It is a hyper object. It exists above all those things. How do you get your local laws to act on Facebook when it operates in every country on the earth, on the planet? Whose laws are you going to listen to? If somebody in, you know, Equatorial Guinea passes a law about Facebook use, do you think Facebook's going to listen? Must be fucking joking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And countries have changed what they were going to do on that basis. Uh huh. And they said, well, we'll just stop this in Australia. And the Australian government really quickly realised you can't do that. Or we can't allow them to do that. This is a fundamental part of our economy. You know. Companies that advertise on this platform are going to say, what the hell are you doing, government? You are stopping us from operating. You're stopping us from operating globally. How are global customers going to find us without this service that actually connects us to a customer base? The Australian government is like, shit, yeah. <laughs> sucks to be you. You have to be someone extremely powerful. Now, the European Union has had some success at um, curbing some things that Facebook does. Uh, because it is of a scale which is much bigger than one country alone and has a GDP which is 
much bigger than Facebook's, to be quite honest. The United States government, if they wish to, could definitely make Facebook do changes, but it's not actually in the interest of the United States government to do that, because the United States government really uses Facebook as a giant surveillance tool, so it doesn't really want to do that anyway. So, it's so big that there's no point in thinking of it, you know, it's not just that thing. Now, I've taken this from the course textbook. By the way, are you all aware that you all have a copy of the course textbook? Is there anyone unaware of this? It's fine if you don't, if you are. You know about this? You didn't know? Didn't know? Didn't know? Didn't know? You know, Caitlin? No? Okay, so let's take a second here so you can go to it. Go back to Canvas for a second on your computer screen. Or if you, if you, not, not you. <laughs> but you already know anyway, Diana. So, okay, so go into Canvas, go to uh, 232. I'm actually going to peer over your shoulder, Maddie, so I can get this right, okay? Um, go into Modules. Then go down to, keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. Uh, keep on going. Go back up, sorry, sorry. <laughs> go back up. It's not in that one, definitely. It's this way. Uh, in the box that says module information, you'll see uh, module guide, assessment one pro forma, assessment one marking guidelines, and then a link called module reading. If you hit that link, it has all the books for this module in it, free. Did you not all not know about this? Okay. Do not tell anyone. Okay? That is a leak. Fuck's sake. That is a leak. I'm going to have to edit this video, okay? That is illegal. That is a, co that is a breach of copyright laws. It will get me into trouble if you tell anyone. I do you a favour, you do me a favour, alright? Okay. So, in the main course textbook, which is uh, written by Zoe Tanya Sujon, she outlines her thoughts on Facebook, but this was in a paper that um, Zoe Tanya did a couple of years before. She looked at um, sort of patterns of usage for teens, early 20s people with Facebook in response to this idea that it was becoming less popular. Her observation is, it's far from meaningless. Yes, people use it less, but the specific way of using it has changed. That's the thing. So, it's a personal service platform for coordinating events, archiving, and for maintaining relationships, in particular long distance or, you know, loose ties with people who you might have added as Facebook connections over time. This is not how it was used by younger people 10 years ago. It was a very different usage pattern. It doesn't mean it's irrelevant. It doesn't mean people aren't using it. It's just that they're using it for specific things. In terms of the overall business model, it's not really that different. Facebook doesn't really care that you don't use it that much. It cares that you use it. It would like you to use it more because it can leverage more money from it. But using it, but having a presence there is enough for it at the end of the day. Some theorists have argued that Facebook acts as a kind of atmosphere. Atmosphere in that it sits in the background of everything. It is always around. Everything around us is linked in some way to Facebook. The shops that we go in have Facebook profiles. You, the logo is ubiquitous, right? You see it everywhere. That atmosphere orients us to the world in particular ways. We are aware of its presence at all times. And because of that, it informs our everyday practices. Now, you may not post to Facebook, but the principle of behaving in a way that is in accordance with this could be on social media. That's from Facebook. 
That is a set of behavioural characteristics which came out of this service. The idea that you always have to be aware that your actions can be captured and shared by others, which we're all aware of, right? You're always thinking, better not do this mad thing because it'll end up somewhere. That is Facebook as an atmosphere. The principles of how it works are everywhere. I mean, it goes back to something you were saying, Maddie, about your relationship with it, that you felt you had to come back on to these services when you came to uni. That's that atmospheric presence of it, right? You, you, you may not have been using it, but you knew they were there. And when you went into a different situation, you felt you had to re-engage in that way because otherwise you would have been outside of everything that goes on, right? It kind of illustrates the atmospheric point in a really nice way. As an operating system, so numerous people have argued that Facebook is an operating system for everyday life. How, well, how does this work? Well, as a operating system, it coordinates, it logs, it allows us to do things, and, it allows, and then it measures our activities and constantly guides our behavior in certain ways. It is always providing us with things to do, things to see, and most importantly, of course, things to buy. This is thinking outside of just Facebook as a site. This is Instagram, this is WhatsApp. There are nudges, there are suggestions, pushing information to you. I don't know why I picked that picture. That's, that's freaking me out a little bit. <laughs> there, might, there was a reason why I chose that picture. I can't remember why. Because um, it's not a town square. You wrote it down wrong. So you did that. That's amazing. That's exactly what I was thinking at the time. It isn't a town square. That is. But that, but Facebook isn't. That is a town square somewhere in Bavaria, I think. I can't remember where. I suggest. I recommend Bavaria. It's kind of cool. But um, Facebook is not. It's. This is an analogy which is often used for social networks. Facebook, Twitter. You know, it's the, the town square where people can group together. And say, no, it's not a town square. It's the entire fucking planet. That's how the scale it operates on. If it isn't a small place for individuals to meet, it is everything. It is huge. It is global. It is a planet rather than a town square. That town square analogy used to really knock me off, like 10, 15 years ago when I first started researching social media. My master's degree, Christ almighty, that was a long time ago, was on social media when Facebook just blew in 2007. And even then people were saying, oh, look, the best way of understanding this analogy is as...